Welcome everyone. I'm glad to see we've got people uh, still joining. Um, hopefully numbers will continue to rise. I'm Ed Ludlow. I will be technical host for this evening's webinar. A um, couple of points. We are recording the session and we need to make you aware of that and the recording will be made available afterwards. Uh, if you have questions, please submit those via the Q&A portion of Zoom or in the chat uh, and then I will field these to Sir Bob where appropriate, who as chair will call upon the questions later. We will be reading the questions out loud. We're not going to unmute people. Um, I think it's just too complicated and you know, microphones don't work just when you don't want them to. Um, so now without further ado, I'll hand over to our chair for this evening, Sir Bob Neill. Thank you very much, Ed, and welcome everybody. Delighted that you're able to join us for uh, another in our series of webinars uh, that we've been holding as a society to, to adapt to changing circumstances uh, and uh, as you can see, uh, we're going to have what I think is an immensely important uh, discussion uh, about access to justice and legal aid, uh, very topical issues, uh, and one's really important thanks to all of us as, uh, as professionals. And so um, we've got a very strong um, panel uh, here. I'm delighted to, to welcome all of them. Uh, none of them really need any introduction to you, but I'm just uh, going to, to say hello to um, our own chair of research, uh, Guy Sandhurst, Guy Mansfield, of course, many of us remember yeah. him, when, when, when at the bar. Um, Sir James Mumby, who was well known to us all as former president of the family prison, and uh, uh, Sir Rupert, formerly Lord Justice Jackson. Delighted to see you all. Uh, and also Andrea Coomer, uh, who's joining us from Perth in Australia. Welcome, Andrea, uh, from uh, Liberty. So, uh, great team. Director of Justice. Indeed. Yes, Director of Justice, indeed. Yeah. And uh, Alex Chalk, uh, the Under Secretary of State. Uh, for um, Minister of Justice. Delighted to see you, Alex, and uh, uh, my next-door neighbour here in Port Cullis House, and of course a uh, former practising member of the bar uh, himself. So, without more ado, so that we can crack on, I'm now going to hand over uh, to Guy Sandhurst. Guy, over to you. Right. Thank you, Bob. Um, I'm going to focus on some history and figures to set out the context for what you will hear from the speakers to come. I'm particularly grateful to Alex Chalk as Minister for joining us. I begin by reminding you that the Conservative Manifesto at the last election committed th this government to access to justice for ordinary people. It was a Conservative, Lord Rushcliffe, who chaired a cross-party committee in 1944 and 45. Its report was unanimously approved and adopted it was the foundation for the Legal Aid and Advice Act 1949. Its core recommendation was that legal aid should be available in all courts and in such manner as will enable persons in need to have access to the professional help they require. 70 years on, we have not begun to meet this. When the legal aid scheme was set up, approximately 80% of the population was eligible for civil legal aid. By 2009, that figure had dropped to 36%. It is fewer people now. A crucial burden on the legal aid budget has been the impact of criminal legal aid. This has risen exponentially. It has squeezed out provision for civil and family matters. More recently, an additional burden has been the cost of asylum cases. Thus, for example, in the period 1997 to 2005, spending on criminal legal aid rose by 37%. But spending on civil legal aid, in which I include family work, if asylum places are excluded, fell by 24%. So crime spending up 37, civil and family down 24. That is expenditure on English nationals for ordinary litigation. In April 2013, the Legal Aid and Sentencing, Sentencing and Pun Punishment of Offenders Act 2012, which I shall call LASPO, took effect. At the end of the first year, the National Audit Office reported. It observed, importantly, that from 1997 to 2013, that's 16 years, 
spending on civil legal aid was pretty much constant in real terms, fluctuating between one and 1.2 billion pounds per annum adjusted to then 2013-14 prices, so 1.2 billion then. In other words, at that date, 2013, there had been no out of control legal aid expenditure on civil matters for many, many years. By 2019, using the Legal Aid Agency's own statistics, the real cost of the civil and family legal aid budget had fallen materially by at least 25% during that further five years. In 14 legal aid areas, no face-to-face -face civil work was started in 2013-2014, sorry, not legal aid, local authority areas. Financial elig eligibility levels had been lowered. Many categories of cases had been removed from its scope altogether. I'm going to take just two big examples, family and housing, to look at the impact. In the context of family matters, the National Audit Office reported in November 2014 that in the year following its reforms, there had been a 30% year-on-year increase in family court cases in which neither party had legal representation. Fewer parties were using mediation as an alternative to the courts than had been before. Mediation assessments had fallen by more than 17,000. So the number of parties engaging in mediation fell substantially. The result? More contested private law family hearings involving one or both unrepresented parties. The Legal Aid Agency publishes annual reports. Its 2019 report stated, the implementation of LASPO in April 2013 resulted in large reductions in legal help workload and expenditure at around one third of pre lasco levels. So that six years a cut of one third. I turn away now from family matters and I want to draw attention to a scheme called specialist support, which had operated from around 2000 to 2012. Under this, the Legal Aid Fund provided modest funding, under five million pounds in all each year, to specialist not-for-profit agencies and one or two specialist sets of chambers and firms of solicitors. That was to give advice and assistance in the field of social welfare and housing, five million pounds a year. There was never any suggestion that the money was misused or ill-spent, the Legal Aid Agency and its predecessor, the um, Legal Services Commission, accepted that. But in 2013, after LASFO, the money stopped completely. That had a major impact. Thus, Shelter suffered a cut in funding of over 50% to the Legal Aid for its legal services. In March 2013, Shelter was forced to close nine of its offices around the country. In many parts of the country, as you will hear from Andrea, there is now little or no specialist provision of adequate legal services in the complex field of housing. Yet housing law affects very large numbers of people. How are we going to go forward? We need an approach which integrates three prongs. First, at least a modest increase in civil legal aid funding, but I accept of no greater an order than can be absorbed within a sensible MOJ budget. But such money must be found, not least for something akin to specialist support and to help the family courts. Secondly, government should promote some new funding sources. I suggest three which need promotion and at least investigation. Before the event insurance, known as BTE, damages-based agreements, DBAs, 
and contingency legal aid funds. Well, let me explain very briefly to the uninitiated. You'll hear more about these from Rupert. BTE is before the event litigation insurance. Some of us here today have it, no doubt, as bolt-ons to our household insurance policies, but many do not. Government should promote this because being pooled funds in advance of any incident occurring, it's a cheap source for funding litigation when it becomes necessary. Damages-based agreements. Under these, the prospective litigant agrees to pay a fixed percentage of monies recovered to the lawyers. This drives the lawyers to minimize costs to maximize profit, because their take is the same whether the costs are high or low. That's much better than conditional fee agreements, where the higher the lawyer's costs, the greater the proportional success fee. What's a CLAF? That's a pooled fund to be run by the legal aid agency or other not-for-profit vehicle. A CLAF would fund litigation in return for receiving a percentage of winnings, so only operating damages claims. The lawyers are paid fees, win or lose. They might be paid less if they lost, but they would get fees. The fund uses the recoveries to fund further cases. We haven't got one at the moment, but I've been promoting the concept for many years. Continued reform of civil practice. That's the third link. So third prong. First, modest increase to civil legal aid funding. Second, new funding sources. And thirdly, continued reform to build on the Jackson reforms. There must be further reductions in costs. Those costs must be predictable to intending litigants and their funders. Predictable costs must become a gold standard. The economic impact of COVID-19 means that many who have hitherto considered themselves self-sufficient are now relatively vulnerable. More people than ever before in the last 20 years will need some assistance in legal proceedings. For too many, such assistance will not be available. What would their conservative peer, Lord Rushkin, say? Enforcement of rights is about more than money. It's about redress and a sense of fairness and having a valued place in society. So we must look for ways to do this, which are cost efficient and effective. If you want to learn more, read my paper, the link to the um, flyer. Um, so please, please, please think about this seriously, all of you here today. And now I'll hand over to James. Absolutely. Well, welcome, James. I'm going to focus uh, primarily on, uh, exclusively on family law, but which I still think I know a little. Um, can I first identify two realities? Uh, the first reality is that there is no prospect, in my view, that this government will reverse LASPO. I'm not going to waste my time arguing that anybody should. And secondly, and this is the great distinction between family and civil, the outside financial resources which can be deployed in civil cases are simply not in the nature of things available in family cases. Uh, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have considerably improved funding of the third sector, particularly in family cases. One of the problems is that traditionally the legal aid scheme focuses on the concept of the individual litigant being uh, supported and assisted by the individual lawyer in private practice. Uh, that, of course, is and always will be vital. But there are other ways in which, departing from that model and uh, utilizing the third sector in all its manifestations, one can, I think, get more benefit uh, to uh, the general body of litigants at a lesser cost. Well, what then is the way forward in family cases? Uh, there are, I suggest, two. The first is making specific and targeted adjustments to the current legal aid arrangements. And the second is making the system more intelligible to the litigants in person who will inevitably remain a very large constituency in family litigation. Now, folks, on the adjustments to legal aid, what do I have in mind? 
And let me divide this into the two main categories. First of all, public law, that is care cases. Uh, and secondly, private law cases, which are essentially, as their name would suggest, uh, private disputes between parents who cannot, uh, following a uh, relationship breakdown, agree as to the arrangements for their children. Now, in relation to public law cases, it has been rightly accepted for a very long time that parents facing care proceedings, which may result in the permanent loss of their children forever, uh, should be entitled to legal aid, which is both non-means tested and non-merits tested. That is absolutely fundamental. If one is still allowed to talk about such things, it is fundamental, not least in terms of our compliance with Article 6 of the Convention. But um, that doesn't always cover all situations. And there are particular problems in relation to applications against parents for placement orders. Now, for those who are not family lawyers, a placement order is an essential prerequisite preliminary to the making of an adoption order. And therefore, the stakes for the parents in a placement order application are at least as high off, as high as high and often higher than in care cases. And yet, unless the minister is able to tell me that there have been recent changes to plug the gaps, I'm not aware of any, that there are regrettable gaps there, which do on occasions mean that parents are left facing the potential horror of resisting a placement order application, the risk of losing their children forever without the benefit of legal aid, and in circumstances where they are thrown on the charity of uh, family justice professionals. Uh, they almost invariably come to the rescue, but in a caring, decent society, why should uh, fundamentally important litigation of this sort uh, be dependent upon the charity, the goodwill uh, of the professions? So that's the first thing I think we need to focus on. Uh, secondly, and a much bigger problem, uh, is that we need uh, legal aid, uh, non-means tested, non-merits tested, for all potential special guardians in care cases. Uh, special guardians are kinship carers. They're members of the wider family who come forward uh, in times of crisis. And when the parents themselves can't look after their children, they step into the breach and say, we, uh, granny, grandpa, uncle, aunt, um, sometimes elder siblings, we will step into the beach and we will take over the care of these children. The benefits of that are enormous. Uh, first of all, the children in such cases are kept within the ambit and the care of the loving family. And secondly, in the long run, there is a drastic reduction in the cost to the state of looking after children in care if those children are in fact placed in the care of kinship carers, family members, a means of what technically is called a special guardianship order. Uh, special guardians uh, who play a vital role in many care cases do not qualify uh, for legal aid uh, in the same way as do the parents. The consequence of that is that they're marginalized in the proceedings. They typically do not have legal representation. They don't know how to ask the questions which are vital if they are to understand what it is they're taking on, and they don't know how to tease out of the local authority the future commitments, whether in terms of financial care, whether in terms of practical support, uh, whether in terms of what I call emotional support, which they're entitled to, and which if they are properly represented, they would ask for. This is an enormous gap in the present system. Um, one reads too often for comfort, heart-rending accounts, of special guardians who motivated often at very short notice uh, by great concern for children, whether they're nieces, nephews, or grandchildren, uh, enter into something with only a very dim awareness of what it is they've taken on. It is in practical terms, a long-term, a lifelong commitment. And the least we can do as a decent society is make sure they're properly represented uh, in the uh, phase in court. They are, need to say, people who've never previously been in a court in their lives. Um, and the third thing, which is equally, if anything, more important, 
in the context of public law care cases is there has got to be adequate legal aid for par parents in the pre-proceedings phase in all care cases. At present, there is the equivalent of what when I was young was called green form legal aid. Uh, it is a one-off payment in some ridiculously modest amount uh, to enable parents in that pre-proceedings phase to obtain some kind of legal advice. The amount is so inadequate, the arrangements are so inadequate uh, that the parents stumble into the care proceedings without having had the opportunity, which they would with proper advice, of discussing with the local authority whether it may be possible to avoid care proceedings altogether. And that is a very realistic and a very proper and possible outcome. And it ought to be obvious that money is spent in heading off care proceedings, money is spent before the proceedings are launched, and diverting what would otherwise be litigation into non-litigious solutions is money very well spent and money which will save an awful lot of money down the line. It is a classic example of what I would call front loading. It is front loading which is necessary in the interests of children. It's front loading which is necessary in the interests of parents, both in the short term and in the long run. And on top of all that, it has the capacity to save money not merely if one can avoid the care proceedings altogether, but also even if the care proceedings do have to continue, because the parents will be entering upon those care proceedings with a much better understanding of what the issues are, what the realities are, and what they can and cannot argue than if they're suddenly plunged into proceedings at uh, virtually no notice and with very little, if any, previous legal advice. So those are the three things which I suggest are desperately needed in the context of public law. Uh, let me move uh, briefly to private law. Now, I am not suggesting uh, that we reverse LASPO and simply restore legal aid to private law cases in the form which had existed before 2013. But there are three things which we need to do. The first is this, a fundamental part of the legislative scheme which was part and parcel of LASPO in 2013, and which was made part of the family justice reforms which came into force in 2014, was mediation. Mediation was the great solution propounded by government uh, as a means of keeping people out of the family courts, a means of uh, enabling people to resolve their cases in a humane and conciliatory fashion rather by means of expensive litigation. Mediation, for all sorts of reasons, has proved a complete disaster. The number of mediations plummeted, um, and uh, they have never regained the position they had uh, before the events of 2013-2014. Uh, the reasons for that are many, and I don't want to go in, I'll have time to go into those, them now. But there is one big problem and that is we don't yet have adequate legal aid uh, for both advice before and in the context of and representation during mediations. And it is essential that legal advice is available for both parties to mediation. Uh, otherwise, uh, the, legal, the legal aid you're spending, money that you're spending, uh, is not going to be well used. So we need better legal aid for advice and representation in mediations in family cases. Uh, secondly, and this is terribly, terribly important, there is the appalling, seemingly uh, endless and very damaging problem of domestic abuse in our society. I am old enough to remember the introduction of the first legislation on that in 1976. Well, here we are, uh, 45 years almost on, and the problems are still with us. There is a particular problem in the context of legal aid in the family of courts. Uh, if there is an allegation of domestic abuse, then subject to certain fairly low uh, threshold conditions, the applicant who is seeking a remedy is entitled to legal aid. The respondent is not. Uh, and that has a number of serious problems. One, if you want to put it in conceptual terms, 
uh, is a gross inequality of arms uh, between the applicant, typically a woman, and the respondent, typically but not always a man. Uh, but uh, that has more profound consequences. Uh, if one side is legally aided and the other is not, in circumstances where the non-legally aided respondent has to appear as litigant in person, then the ability of the court to do justice is seriously impaired. And that uh, can only operate to the disadvantage and detriment, and potentially the very serious detriment and long-term detriment, not merely of the parties to proceedings, that is, the man and the woman, the mother and the father, but also to their children. And what is needed, it seems to me, for all sorts of reasons, not least in the interests of the children, who are the unseen uh, and uh, often overlooked victims of so much domestic abuse, is that legal aid should be available on, made available on the same basis, uh, both to the applicant and to the respondent, in those cases where the applicant is entitled to and obtains legal aid. And the third aspect of this is uh, what I do not hesitate to describe as a shocking public scandal. Uh, it is the fact that we are unable at present in the family courts, unlike the criminal courts, to prevent the cross-examination in domestic abuse cases of alleged victims by the alleged perpetrator. That was made impossible by legislation in the previous millennium applicable to the Crown Court. The problem was first identified by a family division judge in 2006. I spent the whole of my time as president of the family division uh, trying to get something done about this, but nothing has as yet been done, although the legislation is creeping its way through Parliament. What is required is both a statutory prohibition in family cases, analogous to that in criminal cases, of the cross-examination by alleged abusers of their alleged victims, and that in turn requires proper funding, proper public funding of the legal representation in such cases uh, on the, in the interest of the alleged perpetrator so that the perpetrator's case can be put properly by an independent lawyer, thus sparing the alleged victim uh, the abuse and indignity and sometimes worse, which at present they have to suffer. Uh, we are now towards the end of 2020. Uh, the then minister in January 2017, when this matter was first raised um, in recent years, uh, announced in the Commons that the uh, problem was very simple. It was capable of an easy and simple solution. Uh, and you could see no reason why the relevant legislation uh, couldn't be enacted fairly quickly. When pressed by members of the House, why can't we do it by Easter, that is Easter 2017, the minister became somewhat coy. And here we are in the autumn of 2020, uh, the legislation is creeping through, the, creeping through Parliament, uh, but we still have this public scandal. Uh, and I speak with some vehemence on the subject of delay, because every single day, somewhere, in some family court in this country, some victim is being victimized by a, an abuser, an alleged abuser, who is using the court process to extend the abuse from the domestic setting into the very setting of the court itself. And one has to ask, over the three and a half years that have gone by, since the minister made his promise in January 2017, how many women have been subjected to this ongoing, continuing abuse? Abuse not just by their partners, but abuse by the system. Um, it is shocking, it is a scandal, and there is a desperate need for public money to be made available to put a stop to it. Now, those are my targeted suggestions in relation uh, to um, legal aid. The second string to my bow was making the system intelligible. Now, the present system 
is a system designed by lawyers for lawyers on the assumption that everybody will be represented. And the consequence of that is that we have rules, uh, whether the CPR or in the family context, the FPR, which are unintelligible, even to the intelligent layman. We have court forms which are equally unintelligible. Um, and there is, it seems to me, a pressing need to do two, three things. First of all, we need to simplify the existing rules and streamline the process of the family courts. Gentle reminder on time. Sorry, Sir James. I'm just finishing. Thank you. Sorry. Secondly, we have to simplify court forms. And thirdly, we need better guidance. Guidance drafted in the way which ordinary people could understand. And that, I'm afraid, means guidance drafted by people who are not lawyers, because although it pains me to say so, lawyers are not capable of drafting guidance in a way which is intelligible to ordinary people. Um, I will have spent my time and I will now close. Well, thank, th thank you very much, Sir James. And it's th those are issues, I must say, that ring a, uh, a very strong uh, bell for a lot of us who served on the Justice Committee, because I know many people have ventilated some of those issues very, very powerfully as you have uh, tonight, but us uh, in the past and very recent past too. So can we then move on now to uh, Andrea Coomba um, from Justice? Thanks, Bob. Um, it's a, a great privilege to be asked to speak with you tonight. Um, a caveat, first of all, I'm not a legal aid lawyer, and justice doesn't work on reform of legal aid. Um, I do sit on the MOJ's Legal Support Advisory Group, which was set up following the LASPO review, uh, and follow uh, developments in the space. But I feel a bit of a fraud, um, particularly with Bob and Alex, who were both party to that justice committee's inquiry 2015, was it? Um, that was really excellent. Um, for those of you who don't know, Justice is a cross-party um, law reform organisation based on a membership. We work on access to justice, fairness um, in the justice system for over 60 years. If you're not already a member, uh, you must sign up. Um, Guy for many years served on our, uh, on our council and I'm really delighted uh, that various things that Justice has worked on over the years have found favour in his paper. Uh, for example, in 1966, uh, Justice put the case for a contingent legal aid fund. Uh, we did so again in 1978 and again in 1992. Uh, something we've been quite keen on. Um, and a lot of the issues that were elaborated in our 1971 report, the year before I was born, uh, which was called Litigants in Person, highlighted challenges in access to justice uh, that remain exactly the same today. At that time, there were about 60 or 70 litigants in person a year before the High Court. Um, but we recommended a variety of procedural remedies to allow more flexibility in case management, um, to make court processes more intelligible uh, and to expand uh, legal aid. Um, and then in, nine, in 2015, shortly after I joined Justice under my directorship, uh, Sir Stanley Burnton chaired a working party of our members um, with a report entitled Delivering Justice in an Age of Austerity, uh, which Guy refers to in his paper, which looked at where in a world where very few people can access legal advice um, because of cost of legal services and falling legal aid, they might find resolution in the courts through a more investigatory approach uh, and the expanded use of technology. Um, and that work was picked up by Lord Justice Briggs as he then was in his civil money claim, uh, civil court structure uh, report um, around that time. Um, and that work has informed the reform program ever since. Um, so that's a bit about justice. We work on lots of other things, but you must all join. Um, I've been asked to speak about housing and social welfare, and obviously they're among the areas most uh, seriously hit by cuts to legal aid in recent times. Um, and we've done uh, recent and current work on both issues. Um, so some broad principles that inform our work, and these are picking up things already talked about by Guy and by James. Um, we know that there's a significant access to justice gap. Um, lawyers cost a lot of money um, and the potential cost risks of civil litigation mean that many individuals, most individuals and small businesses, are effectively priced out of, of having lawyers. Um, and at the same time, they've got a diminution of legal aid, so now only really poor people in limited sets of circumstances can qualify. Now, that was exacerbated and highlighted by LASPO, um, but that's been a trend for 20 years under all colours of government. Um, and it means that most people in the United Kingdom simply can't access lawyers in order to access justice. Um, and a lot of justices, the organisation's work, um, has looked into ways that we can make processes 
uh, simpler, more user-centred, uh, and that's very much what the Delivering Justice report was about. Um, picking up on what James was just saying about sort of the unintelligibility of uh, court processes, that's also something uh, we've done a lot of work about, and in fact, two years ago, two and a half years ago, uh, had a report that Nick Blake shared for us on understanding courts about how we can make all of those processes um, simpler, including court processes, how we can make court less intimidating, confusing um, for, for ordinary people. Um, and, uh, and, and I encourage you all to have a look at that. Our view is that if you can offer more efficiency in access to civil justice for people who are able to help themselves, partly through technology, you can then save resources for face-to-face -face and intensive report a support to those vulnerable people who need it most. And we'd strongly recommend uh, Welcome Guy's idea uh, for the reintroduction of legal aid into areas of market failure, uh, including in housing and social welfare. Um, the extent of legal aid deserts is really well documented post LASPO, uh, and uh, the government has recognised the value of early legal advice. Um, and technology, we need to use technology more and we use, use it better. I mean, it's very easy to dismiss the reform program as a cost saving measure. Um, it's supported by my organization and by the senior judiciary as a vehicle for extending access to justice to people of moderate means um, who are currently excluded. And we continue to do lots of work on digital exclusion. Um, but it's important to, to note that at the moment we don't have full inclusion of everybody anyway. Our system is already um, sort of failing. Um, so we have, um, we've worked, done, done a lot of work on that. Um, to housing, we had a report that came out in March this year. Um, Guy's paper has highlighted the problems with housing advice, um, and there are massive shortfalls across the country. In excess of 50% of local authorities no longer have housing, uh, have a housing advice supplier, a provider. Um, most housing advice provision is centralised in London, um, and we need national coverage and innovations um, to, to sort of ensure that ac there's access. Uh, to get a full sense of the picture, um, Ed's going to kindly put up a map for me. Um, can you do that, Ed? Just coming Which, now. <laughs> thank you. This is, a, this is from the, the Law Centre's website, um, but this is where the Law Centres in the country are, and you can see that there are whole swathes um, of particularly the West Country, um, but other parts of the country as well, where there are simply no law centres um, at all. Um, and obviously that, um, sorry, oh, how do I get out of here? Um, I mean, my understanding is that in the latest round of bids for housing legal aid contracts, there wasn't a single first round bid for Cornwall, uh, for example, and in the second round bid, there was one submitted for online advice, which would be beamed from London uh, through Skype uh, to Cornwall, which might not seem ideal, but is certainly an innovation worth exploring to be able to secure advice. Um, and COVID has presented more acute challenges for housing. Shelter estimates that a quarter of a million people are facing rent arrears eviction. Um, and, and we've only actually two days ago, 24 hours, 48 hours ago, um, had the Master of the Rolls' working group on possessions talk about what it's going to do to deal with, um, uh, with the possession proceedings, which will commence in four days' time on the 20th of September. Um, our report in March this year called Solving Housing Disputes recommended a new way of dealing with um, housing disputes, um, which would require early access to advice, information, and enable a problem-solving approach to resolve disputes. Um, it was premised not just on dealing with individual disputes, but rather on remedying underlying issues that give rise to housing claims and sustaining ta tenant and landlord relationships uh, beyond the life of a dispute. Um, and we proposed something we called a housing dispute service, um, which we, although we also recommended sort of amendments to the current system, we expected it would take a lot of time to get breakthrough on this kind of approach, but COVID brings uh, some innovation with it. And, the Master of the Rolls' Possession Group has suggested an approach very much in line with many of the ideas recommended in our report. They're explicitly encouraging early advice, compromise, settlement, not just to manage the sheer volume of cases, um, but also as to, to maintain fair outcomes. Um, so there'll be a new advice provision, non-means tested, free of charge, legal aid services and advice available to defendants uh, through duty scheme arrangements, 28 days rather than 
uh, before the first hearing rather than the day before the first hearing. Uh, a more proactive approach to recognising the impact of COVID uh, and a mediation pilot which will offer an independent mediator with duty, duty scheme experience to help people try to resolve uh, their disputes. Um, so, I mean, all of this is obviously predicated on this access to advice, which is being funded by, by the legal aid agency, as we understand it, um, and recognising that that can be delivered through different sorts of mechanisms. Um, and we look forward to working with the, the Ministry of Housing and MOJ on that and testing it. I mean, these ideas of dealing with disputes differently are definitely controversial. Um, there was, our report proved extremely unpopular uh, with aspects of the law centre's uh, housing people, experts, um, who declared it worse than LASPO. Um, but where you've got a sector where there are literally swathes of the country with no housing advice, relying on an adversarial system which allows for little room for restoration of a housing relationship and requires people to go it alone doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem sustainable. Very briefly, because I'm running out of time, on social welfare law, law we've, we're currently convening a working party with the Administrative Justice Council looking at reform of benefits decision making that's chaired by Lord Lowe of Dalston. Um, which is looking at DWP decision tribunals um, and then providing support to claimants accessing the benefits system. Um, what's interesting for today's panel is the operation of tribunals. 60% of claimants who are, are successful at the tribunal. Um, so we need to think about taking advantage of swifter tribunal decision making, perhaps offering paper-based and a range of other options for them. Um, and given what we know about digital capability through the pandemic, where people haven't necessarily been able to access uh, proxy users, go to McDonald's to use the Wi-Fi, all of those sort of things. We need to make sure that the technology is really available um, to people who, who are able to then embrace it. Um, and then there's advice provision. Welfare advice is desperately important. Failure of advice can drive people into poverty, put pressures on health services, local authorities, uh, to say nothing of the impact on the criminal justice system. Um, and early legal advice in this context is particularly important, and Guy Max makes the case for it beautifully in his report. Um, I think the truth is that everybody, uh, Alex, everybody in the MOJ understands the value um, of legal aid and particularly of early legal advice. Uh, and so we're in very many ways preaching to the choir, but like James, I don't know that there's going to be any money for it under this, or I suspect any other government. And I think the existential challenge is to make the case to society that legal aid, in fact, the justice system more broadly, is a public good, just like schools and hospitals uh, and the roads, that there is a value in it uh, for everybody. Um, now, I appreciate that there are many demands on the public purse, and it's not an easy sell, but I think ultimately that's going to be the real challenge, um, because without it, um, it's going to be very difficult to make um, legal services affordable in the way we need them to be and accessible. Thank you. That's very helpful, Andrea. Thank you very much. And uh, we see where I've got to now. I think if we now move on uh, to Rupert, we are going to have to try and squeeze it in um, just in case Alex and I have to vote. But Rupert, delighted to see you uh, and over to you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've got your message about timing and we'll bear that uh, in, in mind. Uh, we have just heard uh, powerful presentations from James uh, in relation to uh, family justice and legal aid and from Andrea uh, in relation to housing and social welfare. Uh, there is nothing which either of those two speakers has said with which I disagree. Uh, I strongly support uh, uh, what James has said about the benefits of mediation, the importance of targeting uh, 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 adjustment to uh, as legal aid, uh, and likewise Andrea's points. Uh, one slight problem for me uh, is that LASPO did two different things. It dramatically cut back uh, legal aid uh, in uh, family and civil litigation. It, it, it also introduced my uh, package of reforms. And when people talk about reversing LASPO, sometimes they're, uh, I think generally they're talking about reforming the, re reversing the legal aid bit rather than my bit. So, uh, so there one is. Um, uh, be that uh, as it uh, may, um, I'm specifically asked to talk this afternoon really about general civil litigation. Uh, and in that regard, 
uh, I congratulate Guy on his very excellent paper, which I read from start to finish, it must be admitted a, a few weeks ago now, which deals very comprehensively with these issues. Uh, in, in particular, I agree with what Guy said there and repeated this afternoon about the importance of developing different methods of funding civil litigation. One of the guiding principles in my work has always been to uh, uh, extend methods of funding civil litigation which are cost neutral and to stamp out methods of funding uh, civil litigation which drive up costs. Uh, all the research which I commissioned and did showed that the old style uh, conditional fee arrangements drove up costs, distorted incentives, uh, uh, and were hugely damaging. Uh, I, I uh, recommended uh, the, the particular matters which Guy referred to, uh, extending before the event insurance, um, uh, introducing DBAs into civil litigation, and I really got onto the uh, bandwagon which justice had started by uh, urging the development of a CLAF, a contingent legal aid fund, a version of that works successfully in Hong Kong, a working group of the bar and the law society was set up to take that forward, but so far as I know, nothing has actually uh, resulted from that. So far as damages based agreements are concerned, they have a very important role to play in providing funding for general civil litigation, but there are two problems. The first is that there are a number of technical defects in the regulations, which I have been urging uh, repair of uh, for a very long time. Uh, Rachel Malheron uh, produced, I think, two reports in all, identifying those shortcomings uh, 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 and uh, setting out how they need to be addressed. But there is also a point of principle. We need hybrid DBAs as well as general DBAs. Um, a general DBA is one which says no win, no fee. But there are some cases which, which lawyers couldn't afford to do on a no win, no fee, but could afford to do on a no win, low fee basis, and which the clients would be content with. That's not allowed uh, under the DBA regulations. It is allowed under the rules governing um, conditional fee agreements. Uh, and for reasons which Guy has mentioned, uh, uh, d damages based agreements are a much better and more efficient way of funding civil litigation uh, than conditional fee agreements. And there is a huge anomaly that hybrids are not allowed under DBAs and are allowed under CFAs. Again, uh, the, the Minister will know that this is a drum which I have been beating for many years uh, without so far uh, getting any support, but I'm sure that after today uh, all will be well on that front. Now, um, uh, uh, just a word about m my involvement. I spent 10 years as a judge in the Court of Appeal, and throughout that time, I only had one extramural responsibility, that is outside, uh, uh, outside listening to barristers and giving judgments, and that one responsibility was to focus on uh, reforming the reform ways to re devise uh, and implement reforms of the civil justice system to make it more efficient uh, and to, the, to cut down the uh, costs and to make it more affordable. Uh, and uh, although uh, no one ever says any reform works well, the assessment made by the Ministry of Justice is that the reforms to uh, conditional fee agreements uh, uh, and related matters and personal injury litigation have worked well. We now have a fast track in which there is a grid of recoverable costs, which actually covers the majority of all uh, fast track cases. Uh, uh, I, I won't go through the other host of reforms, uh, which I uh, endeavoured to introduce and which came into force in 2013. After that, uh, my concerns were to ensure that cost management was conducted in a more efficient way uh, so that uh, litigants uh, would know at an early stage what they were letting themselves in for in terms of their own costs and adverse costs. I have also been very concerned to extend the regime of fixed recoverable costs. Uh, as I said, we 
uh, following my first round of reforms, we have fixed recoverable costs for most fast track cases. But uh, I, I have urged extending that uh, uh, at the request of the MOJ uh, and the Lord Chief Justice, I carried out a, a further review in the first half of 2017. The product of that review was this report, if I can hold it up to the camera. Uh, this report recommended extending the fixed costs to cover all fast track cases and also introducing a regime for fixing the recoverable costs of lower value cases in the multi-track. I defined the cases to which should come within the new regime as claims up to £100,000, where the trial would not take uh, more than uh, three days, uh, uh, and a number of other smaller uh, definitional features. Um, I've put, set out in that report a proposed grid of fixed recoverable co costs this would bring a huge uh, raft of litigants within a fixed regime. They would no longer need to uh, undergo cost budgeting. Instead, they would know at the outset what it would cost if they won and what it would cost if they lost. Uh, uh, and it would um, make the, 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 the cost work of the courts much simpler. I also set out in my report a proposed regime to simplify the procedure for those cases in this intermediate band uh, that essentially involves uh, limiting the length of pleadings, limiting the length of witness statements, uh, limiting experts to one or at most uh, two uh, per side, uh, uh, limiting the uh, length of the trial uh, uh, and setting out guillotines for the amount of time that would be allowed for cross-examining uh, uh, and for uh, making submissions. Now, um, th these reforms, when introduced, won't achieve perfect justice, but they will make it possible for litigants to uh, bring their claims or defences to court, which at the present they're unable to do. I rather hoped that when I wrote my report, people would get on with uh, implementing it. Uh, no such luck. Uh, people uh, sat around discussing it and thinking about it for a number of years. But I've seen recent press articles which say that uh, in uh, 2021, uh, this report is actually going to be implemented. Um, of course, with my, my previous report, uh, I was around in order to see what was going on. Uh, when I thought things were get going uh, awry, I would give lectures and um, uh, uh, suggest to the Rule Committee or others what I thought should be done to put it right. There was one case instance where cost budgeting was going wrong, and I said we should call a halt to the whole thing for three months in clinical negligence cases till it was sorted out, and that was done. Uh, when this new report uh, comes into force next year, I very much hope that a senior judge will be appointed, not just grandly to attend the odd meeting and say it's a good thing, but to roll up his or her sleeves and get down to it, go around the country, talk to judges and solicitors, uh, 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 and get their feedback, and if tweaks are necessary, to propose them. Uh, when my reforms were being uh, introduced, my first round, I went to user committee meetings to discuss, for example, the hot tubbing of experts, where you have experts giving evidence simultaneously on both sides. I talked to experts and solicitors and got useful feedback and then proposed tweaks. Indeed, we piloted that reform. And the same with cost budgeting, which I initially set up on a voluntary basis in a small number of courts. I went there, I talked to user committees uh, 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 and practitioners there. I remember one large meeting of practitioners in Birmingham where we took a vote as to whether or not uh, to, uh, to give this scheme a try. And because uh, I got a small majority in favour, the Birmingham practitioners agreed to give it a try. Uh, but the point I'm making is that civil justice reform isn't simply a matter of a judge on high drafting a report, the rule committee drafting the rules, and then everyone getting on with it. You've got to have someone who's really steeped in the details, who oversees it, goes out to meetings around the country, 
I suppose it'll be virtual now, uh, 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 and is giving lectures when things are going wrong. Uh, I can't do that anymore. Um, I'm now a retired dinosaur. I left the bench two and a half years ago, and I'm plying my trade as an arbitrator. But um, I, I do make the point that this report, when it's implemented, will want close judicial supervision by a senior judge who is sympathetic uh, with its uh, objectives. Um, I think I've probably used up my time allowance, haven't I, Mr. Chairman? I think you probably have, Rupert. It's been very informative and very useful. I'm very grateful to you. Thank you. In that case, I'll shut up. And you make an interesting point about judicial retirement ages, ages as a buy. As a buy. <laughs> well, yes, I'm very miffed about that. <laughs> quite right, too. Um, OK, over to the Minister, Alex. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Bob. And um, thank you very much, Guy, for inviting me to speak this evening. It is genuinely an enormous pleasure and a, and a real honour uh, to be on the pa this panel with such distinguished uh, contributors. Uh, contributors who, uh, uh, as, a, as, a, as a footling practitioner, I uh, very much looked up to uh, at the bar. And, and is, as I say, it's an enormous pleasure to be here. Uh, can I say that the contributions that have been made have all been of such enormous uh, detail and thought that I, I can't sensibly uh, respond to all the points that have been made. So I hope those listening will forgive me if, if necessarily some of my remarks are more general in uh, nature. Uh, but I can say that the, I've had the advantage of having received some notes of what individuals were likely to say. And uh, they're extremely valuable and they make points which um, I'm very keen to, to take forward. So when, for example, Sir James talks about the specific areas in public and private, which he thinks it's, it's axiomatic, should receive more funding. Can I say those points have landed uh, very heavily uh, with me? C can I just also just make one point in terms of picking up uh, what was, what, what's been said, just, just on the specific point about what Sir James said in respect of cross-examination. Um, he's right, of course, that there has been somewhat uh, a glacial pace, some might say, but I do think that we've made real progress in the domestic abuse bill. And I, I hope he will feel that not only the provisions which prohibit cross-examination are, are welcome, but also there has been a, a great deal in there in respect of, for example, the introduction of special measures and the mandatory uh, eligibility for special measures, which echoes the principle that exists in the criminal courts, as he is aware. But also I think it's fair to note that that sits in a wider context of trying to address the needs, not just within the, uh, the, the justice system, but elsewhere of victims and alleged victims of domestic abuse. So whether that's, for example, creating new offenses like a coercive control and under the 2015 Serious Crime Act Section 76, whether it's bringing in a domestic abuse commissioner, whether it's 76 million pounds uh, for, of funding for, for victims of domestic abuse in the course of the COVID pandemic, and so on, domestic abuse protection orders. There is, there is a, a package which, um, you know, I'm, I'm very sensitive that we should be doing right by victims and alleged victims of domestic abuse. And I, I just wanted to pick up that point. Um, just turning to my more general remarks, the report that has been created by Lord Sandhurst, by Guy, is, um, if I may say so, absolutely excellent. And I have read it with interest and with care. And it's valuable for all sorts of reasons. First, because it consolidates and, prov and provides a very helpful history as to the growth of legal aid and some of the important lessons from history in terms of aspiration and scope, but also concrete and helpful suggestions as to how the system can be improved. And I just want to address that. In the course of it, he made a, an important point or important um, observation. He said this, every man is equal before the law but he's got to get before the law before he can attain that equality. Uh, and that's a point that I underlined in uh, triplicate in the margin, because it's absolutely right. And I thought that principle was, was aired very powerfully by Lord Reed in a, a modern aphorism, which has almost become a cliche, but was so powerful in the Unison case when he said, without access to justice, laws are liable to become a dead letter. The work done by parliament may be rendered nugatory and the democratic election of MPs may become a meaningless charade. Well, that was immensely powerful. And I think crystallized the thought that many people inside and outside parliament feel, and I feel absolutely to my fingertips. I, I just want to make this piece as well, make this point as well, because it perhaps informs the 
the way in which I approach all this. In 2018, long before I became a minister or even thought that that was even a possibility, I wrote an article which said this, that without some steps to restore a greater measure of access to justice, serious injustice will inevitably follow. I talked about alarm bells uh, ringing and I called then for more early social welfare law advice and for financial eligibility requirements to be updated. So th those are some points that I made before and there's some points which I, I'm pleased to be able to say I think we are attending to uh, now. So let me uh, just with those opening remarks and thanks uh, say a little about what's happened during COVID and then I'll turn to the the future if I may, mindful of the fact that I need to get a bit of a bit of a move on. So in, in the course of, of COVID, we have been obviously extremely mindful of the pressures that providers have been under. And one of the things that we did, and this was a, a discretionary, a, a, a choice that we made, but it was manifestly the right thing to do, in my view, is that we secured £5.4 million emergency funding for the not-for-profit advice sector to ensure that providers across England and Wales who were staring down the barrel were able to continue. And that meant that the sum that was asked for by the law centres was provided every penny piece. And that's important. Uh, so when they were facing potential collapse, we stepped in and that's something that I am uh, proud of. Uh, e equally, uh, there is uh, work through the, uh, th there were other non, uh, not-for-profit advisors that we funded as well. But I want to also note that in doing that, and this picks up a point that Andrea was making, she, she referred to I think a law centre in, in London providing legal advice down in uh, Cornwall. I think we have to recognise, and this is a point that I made when I was speaking to the law centres, is that no longer can or should we be thinking about the advice that is provided by, say, the North Kensington Law Centre, inevitably to be limited to the North Kensington area. Because whilst, respectfully, Sir James Mumby is absolutely right when he says that face-to-face -face contact remains an incredibly important element of how legal advice and legal assistance is provided, absolutely essential. It's not necessarily the case, I would respectfully submit, that it is required for every last jot and tittle of legal advice that might have been provided in the past. And it may well be that quite a good deal could be provided over the phone. So we have to start thinking boldly about how technology can start to make a difference. And whilst I know some say, and it's been repeated this evening about um, deserts, particularly in respect of housing advice. One of the things that gave me great heart and comfort recently was when I spoke to those uh, practitioners who give advice via the CLA, the Civil Legal Advice uh, Gateway, across the country providing that telephone advice. And that was heartening and an insight as to how we can improve the system in the future using technology. No longer are we hidebound by geography in the way that we were before. And, and the second point I, I, I want to make on that issue of technology is that uh, for those even like me, I was called in 2001, you might think that if you were getting advice, uh, I initially started in civil, but then moved over to crime, that in fact, uh, uh, you might have a, 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 an appointment with counsel to deal with a, a civil matter. The first half an hour of that advice, of that conference might have been do you know what, this is what a court can do. This is what a court can't do. This is what might happen in a small claims track. This is what your liability for costs might be. Is it always the case that that is the only way to deliver some of that preliminary advice before you get to the specific merits of the case? I would argue it probably isn't, frankly, and that there are other ways that we can do it and that there are other providers who might be able to do it as effectively uh, um, as that counsel in that particular circumstance. Of course, you're going to need that advisor to provide advice on the merits of the specific case, but an awful lot of what it might have been communicated in the past might be more generic. And I think there are opportunities there. So let me just say a little bit more um, before developing those points a bit further about litigants in person. This is a point that was powerfully made uh, by Andrea, if I, if I may say so, because it is not necessarily for everyone that they want to actually have the specific legal advice. It is not meant to be a replacement for legal advice, but an adjunct to it in appropriate cases. So I recently launched our new Legal Support for Litigants in Person grant programme, which builds on the more than £9 million that the MOJ have invested in support for litigants in person since 2015. And that new programme is a joint initiative with the Access to Justice Foundation and is designed to fund services provided at a local, regional, and national level. 
And to date, more than £500,000 worth of grants have been awarded to a number of charities. So what are those charities, you might ask? Well, support through court, RCJ advice. They're piloting a new remote support initiative. Lawworks, who will scale up their free legal answers website. And that enables people on low incomes uh, who are not eligible for legal aid to access free initial legal advice. Law for Life, who will add new resources to their Advice Now website to assist people to deal with a range of legal problems, as well as creating uh, new guidance to help individuals appear in virtual courts effectively. So these are really exciting, modern, forward-leaning ideas. And the challenge, it seems to me, is to see how we can use the convening power of the state to ensure that on the one hand, we avoid what I, I don't use the word deserts because we don't accept that there are deserts, but I accept that there is, uh, you, you might think of as, as patchiness, but how do we ensure that there isn't duplication as well? So in other words, what, what is happening is we are investing and supporting a lot of um, specific individual initiatives, I see one of the really important challenges is bringing coherence across the piece to ensure that where we are providing that support, there isn't the duplication, and we're ensuring that where there are gaps, we are filling them. But technology has an enormous role to play in that, and I've already touched a little bit upon how, for example, law centres could expand their reach beyond what they might have thought of as their geographic uh, bailiwick. Let me turn um, to the issue of civil legal aid sustainability, because frankly, there's no point in us looking to expand the scope of legal aid and so on, if there aren't any providers to provide it. Act 1, Scene 1 has to be, of course, the needs of individuals rather than providers because we must meet legal need, but it's also necessary to ensure that there is going to be a, uh, a set of providers available to do that. So we are taking a broad look at the civil legal aid system as, and as I think, and I'm sure you will agree, we can't con create a sustainable legal aid system just by tinkering around the edges. So we are considering fees. We're considering to the pipeline into the profession, but also bigger structural issues such as the delivery model for civil legal aid and improving the remote delivery of advice, which I've touched upon already, where appropriate. And I want to stress where appropriate, not in all cases. And to ensure support is available for those in hard to reach places learning both from what has worked well during the pandemic and indeed what has worked less well. Because as Sir James will know, one of the um, you know, interesting things that emerged from the review that was conducted at lightning pace, by the way, by Sir Andrew McFarlane into respect of how uh, um, the remote uh, hearings had worked in the family division, there were some parts of it that worked well, other parts where people frankly left feeling a bit shortchanged. So we have to make sure that we don't see technology as a panacea, but we see it as an ally and an adjunct. Let me turn briefly to means test review. I, I, it would be remiss not to mention that. It's a vital piece of work to ensure the most vulnerable can get the support they need. Andrea was mentioning how uh, really the, the cadre of people who are eligible for legal aid has shrunk. And as Guy indicated, Lord Sandhurst indicated, it is some way beyond what was indicated in terms of, in terms of the aspirations of the founding fathers back in the 1940s. So we have to have a means test review. We're conscious that the income and capital thresholds have remained unchanged for years. And it's clear to me that ensuring the availability of legal aid for the most vulnerable goes to the heart of my commitment to access to justice. And, and the means test review is an essential element of that. F final thing I want to say is about early legal advice. And this is the point that Sir James made. He called it front loading. Um, I think he must be right about that. Uh, respectfully. Uh, uh, this is my, um, my driving passion in this job and it's what I want to try to improve. Recognising that perfect is the enemy of the good. I can't sit and promise that everything will be solved overnight. I don't think we're going to be uh, repealing LASPO as uh, people have, have sensibly recognised. But I do think that the points that have been made this evening about front loading, about stitch in time, about why it is that that early support is good for litigants and saves heartache and anguish and cost down the line are well made. But so also is the point well made by Lord Sandhurst that these things need to be funded, no doubt within the envelope of MOJ spend. And that is something 
uh, uh, that I am very keen to investigate and to try to secure progress on. But ensuring people have access to early legal support is vital to ensure that the resolution of legal problems is proportionate and that we minimize the burden on courts and tribunals, particularly in the current context. The sector already does fantastic work in this space, including excellent support offered through law centers and not-for-profit uh, providers, which is why we wanted to back them. But I'm keen that we as government do more to facilitate, not to intervene, but to convene. And I think there is a role for the state to do that because the picture at the moment is fragmented. And what was interesting is we hear from Andrea, who is how many miles away? 10,000 miles away, perhaps even more. One of the jurisdictions I've been looking at is Victoria and to see how they go about using the convening power of the state to assist in this area and access to justice. We also looked at Ireland and elsewhere. And it's interesting, if you look at the spend per person, it's actually less, but I think there's an argument for saying that because of the coherence of the way it's produced, arguably you get more bang for your buck. So it's that coherence and that early advice that I'm very keen on. So we are rightly focused on this in our legal support action plan, but I am keen to go further. We are engaging very closely on this in the MOJ. I will be engaging with the sector on this issue in coming months. And let me just close um, by saying that there is real will and determination to drive forward this agenda. The points that have been made this evening resonate with me. They resonated before I became a minister. They resonated as a barrister and they resonate in my role now. Perfection is impossible. Improvement is very achievable. And to make the system of justice, and if I may make so grandiose, the lamp of our liberty burn a little brighter, will be my priority in the months ahead. So those are my remarks, Lord Sandhurst. And Sir Bob. Well, thank you very much, Alex. And uh, uh, without being uh, unduly biased, I think yours was a very welcome appointment. Um, Right, right, right across the house, and I think the legal fraternity as, as, as well, and, and every success with it. And of course, you were a very active member both of the society and of the select committee uh, before you took up uh, that role. So that's great. We do have some questions. We are going to vote at some point tonight, um, so we'll try and bat through them uh, as uh, expeditious as we can. We've gone over time a little bit, but a lot of important issues raised. First question I've got here from Ronan Cormacane. So it's a practical issue. Um, does the involvement of lawyers in family cases increase or decrease the chances of a case being fought in court rather than settled? Uh, and if so, is this a good or a bad thing in general? Uh, I think I can probably work out what some of the answers might be, Ronan, but uh, uh, who wants to go first on that one? Well, Mr. James, you've dealt with it a, a, a lot, and then, then Alex. Well, my quick response would be, it's almost impossible to get to the bottom of this. Um, and MOJ clings to, to the statistics, uh, purporting to show uh, that actually cases are being dealt with more expeditiously uh, post LASPO and pre LASPO. Um, the reality is that many litigants in family cases simply don't know how to conduct their cases. They dry up. You get a handful of people who will talk and rant till the cows come home. But most people in that situation don't know how to present a case. They drop up within minutes rather than hours or days. And therefore, in that sense, the lawyers increase the length of the hearing. What the lawyers are doing are making sure that the case is properly presented. Yeah. And the interests of those people who are incapable of representing themselves are properly represented. Yeah. And do, do you find, Mr. James, unless, unless, we, unless we accept that, we're yeah. going to be beguiled, as it sometimes has suited ministers to be beguiled, by statistics which are actually measuring the wrong thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I always got the sense as well, there's always the risk that people, don't you think, James, that, that people may, without proper early advice, um, commence unmeritorious proceedings, um, which uh, will clog up the courts, but are almost inevitably going to end, end, up, end up nowhere. And um, they don't have that filter to tell them, really, this is not a good route to go down. Anything which is anecdotal is almost always an exaggeration up to a po more or less. But um, I have spent far too many hours sitting in court, cajoling litigants in person to try and present their cases because they simply cannot do it. Yeah. And that is why the PSU, it's now been renamed, was so terribly important. Yeah. 
Um, and cases which ought to have taken half a day were taking 10 or 15 minutes because they were quite incapable um, of saying anything. And tragically, so often what one actually heard from the person was, well, you, you know what this case is all about, Judge. You'll know the answer. I get confidence you'll come up with the right answer. And sit, sitting down. Well, that's not justice. No. Uh, so the answer is lawyers don't add to the length in terms of spinning it out. Uh, lawyers add to the length in terms of the sense that uh, they ensure that proper justice is being done uh, for people who simply cannot represent themselves. Fair enough. Alex, what do you think? Okay, can, can I just make one observation? Is that I entirely uh, accept the points that have just been made about lawyers getting to the heart of the matter and making sure the evidence is tested and so on. The only point I would make is that presupposes that the adversarial system is necessarily the right system in this context. And increasingly, there are those who think that, in fact, uh, that, that isn't necessarily the best way to get to the point. Because in going back to the question that was being asked, it, I, I do think that there is a proper debate to have about whether, in fact, it ought to be more inquisitorial to avoid necessarily those lawyers doing their proper best to get to the heart of the issue in an adversarial system do potentially risk revving everything up in a very sensitive uh, set of circumstances. So it, it's in response to a, a number of the concerns that have been raised in this regard that we are looking at the issues of pilot to pilot integrated domestic abuse court, for example, which ensures you don't necessarily have to have the same issues being litigated twice, depending on the jurisdiction, but also piloting the potential for, for a more inquisitorial approach. I'm not suggesting that any firm and final decisions have been made, but increasingly the feedback that you get from the court users is that the adversarial system is not necessarily the way that they feel gets to either to the, uh, the justice of the case quickest or with the least amount of heartache. Okay. Mr. Right. Chairman, may I add one point, please? Uh, yeah. Uh, J James uh, mentioned the value of the personal support unit, uh, no. an organisation whose name uh, has now changed, but it was PSU when James and I were judges. Yeah. Um, uh, my experience is that the personal support yes. unit uh, gives uh, real assistance to litigants in person. It helps them filling in the forms before the case comes on. It may help them in deciding that they don't need to bring or defend the case at all. And yeah. also a volunteer from the personal support unit will sit next to the litigant in person in court. I have had that experience many times and confirm and can confirm that it's very valuable. When the, uh, Alex was listing the organization to which the Ministry of Justice was uh, giving funds, I didn't hear reference to the personal support unit, I, but maybe you were referring to its new name and it's going to get some cash. But none of the names- Yeah, he, he mentioned, mentioned support Randall. for court, Rupert. That's, that's the one, is it? That's what it's called yeah. now. Good, that's well, what... give it plenty of cash. It does a good job. Of course, <laughs> I use one the liaison judge. Okay. Could I just say one thing about this? And that is that I can see the merit, particularly in the family context. And it's a long time since I did family work, but I did do a lot for 20 years um, of the judges being inquisitorial. But if it's to be done fairly, the point is that the material has to be assembled first and put before the judge. Um, so if you look at the French system, which I gleaned from watching various series um, on the television during COVID, what you can see is that although the judge takes over, particularly in the criminal context and, and runs the thing, the lawyers nonetheless do have a role and they've told the client this and that and, the material, and, 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 and they intervene. Um, so you, can't, you, you can have a lawyer light, but lawyer free, I think, is not going to work. And the judges will just be back where they are at the moment. Okay, well, some, some, some interesting exchanges on that one. I think that's, that's interesting points. Good. Okay, now um, Ronan's been very busy here. Uh, his, his next point are what is is is, is, uh, is about, can lawyers make a living at legal aid work, uh, family, housing, criminal, refugee, and if not, is there a risk of a brain drain uh, as people um, turn uh, to uh, commercial fields? Was somebody who did crime, same as Alex did? Perhaps we both be biased on that one. Uh, but uh, uh, observations, Alex, do you want to come in on that? Well, yeah, ab ab absolutely. So, I mean, I know we're not talking about crime this evening, so I'll, I'll only mention it uh, very briefly. Y yes is, is the short answer. Um, and I'm, you know, one of the things that I'm pleased about is that when quite a lot of money went into CPS 
fees, prosecuting fees, but also in 2018, uh, some 28 million went into AGFS. And we've also put between just now, recently, between 31 and 51, depending on demand, into CLA 2. So that's the Criminal Legal Aid Review 2. And, and yes, the short answer is you can, you can make a living. And there's a very uh, good document that I would commend to you from the CPS website, which indicates what you get paid for a three-day sexual assault case if you're prosecuting and, and so on. And I won't repeat the figures now, but they are, I think that they are, of course, we'd all want more but you can make a living. And I think it would be wrong to suggest that you can't. And indeed, if you're prosecuting an 18 day murder, a double handed murder and you're a silk, uh, the figure is over 40,000 pounds. And I, and I think it would be quite wrong to suggest uh, that, that, uh, that people are unable to make a living. The issue, however, in civil, I recognize is difficult. It is really difficult. And sorry, just but before I go on to civil, what we've really got to ensure is that some of these criminal defenders can make a living because frankly the the average age of court duty solicitors is perilously high we've got to ensure that there's a pipeline of people going in which is why we've got CLA phase two to ensure that it's sustainable but i haven't got time to talk about that in terms of civil yes we need to try to make it more lucrative frankly and that is uh, why we are conducting this review into the provider um, into the provider sustainability. And that's got to look at issues such as fees. So the, the short answer is, yes, it has, to be, um, it has to be a viable profession. Otherwise, all this stuff about legal aid entitlement, you'll be pushing on a piece of rope because there won't actually be the providers there. I'm very conscious of that point, And we need to make sure that it is a, an attractive uh, profession for people to go into. And that's very much a priority. Okay, well, that's a good point. Thank you, Doug. That's it, but well, as there's any observations on that one, let me move on to, this is very interesting. Well, can I just make a very brief point on that? I think there are, there are real concerns in the family justice system. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, not getting enough people coming in at the bottom, particularly at the bar, yeah, the because of their perception that the fees, which in practical terms are legal aid fees, are grotesquely disproportionate to what they can earn in other areas of the work. Yeah. The other thing you have to bear in mind is that once people are in the system, their commitment to their clients and their commitment to helping some of the most underprivileged and damaged and vulnerable people in our society keeps them going. And I think there's a very real problem that as a society, we are at risk of exploiting the commitment of some of our practitioners. Okay, a fair, a fair point again, one that's been made to us on the select committee. Or, or on. Yeah. Uh, okay. can, can I just say on that, Bob, I very much recognize that it's barristers and very often legal aid barristers sense of vocation that is the glue which keeps the whole system going. It, it's those individuals who go the extra mile that, that, that this is why it stays standing. I'm very, very conscious of that. And I, I want to put that on the record. Okay. Well, this is anything else on that one. Let me then just move into this one I think perhaps Guy could address. Um, technical question from Ron. Do the old rules on maintenance and champerty restrict the new funding models that Guy has uh, discussed? No. <laughs> short oh, right. whether I, I, Rupert will correct me wrong, but it's essentially whether it's offensive to justice and it leads to corruption of the system. Yeah. Um, so that, uh, and this goes back to about the early 1990s when the court started, say it started with the fact attained decision and whether or uh, yes. yeah, curiously, there was a case all about it there. Now, if, uh, maintenance and champerty has really gone. Yeah. Um, you, you've just got to behave properly and um, there are rules in place and I don't think it's a serious problem, although um, now and again, people um, do misbehave and then they get picked up. Okay, uh, I, I think that's probably that seems to most people would agree with uh, with that one. So I hope that's cleared that up for uh, for, for our questioner. Um, uh, another question: The government's established an independent review of administrative law with a view to changing the law on judicial review. Is this an opportunity to increase access to justice by funding aid, or will it further restrict the ability of ordinary people to judicially review the actual government? Well, early days yet, I rather suspect is the. Uh, uh, is the answer to that, unless anybody uh, said, yeah. But we don't know what they're going to say, do we? I mean, well, Folks has actually gone public and said he's not going to do away with judicial review. He just wants to look at how, how it's actually interpreted and applied. I think the best thing I'd say as well is, if people have concerns around any of the aspects around judicial review, well, do put into the consultation. 
do uh, uh, you know do do participate uh, and then i'm sure it will be uh, taken on board and we'll see what happens it's something to note but i don't think unless anybody has a view otherwise um, we can have much more on that one uh, at uh, this stage i would like to add one point mr Could chair please yes, um, yes. In environmental cases, there is a cap on the cost liability yes. of the claimant if the case fails. That cap is imposed as a result of the Aarhus Convention, to which the UK is a party. Yeah. Uh, I have long argued that uh, the Aarhus, or Aarhus, how you pronounce it, cap should be extended to other judicial review cases. There is something special about judicial review. It's the citizen challenging the legality of actions of a public body or a government department. Uh, I, I, again, in, I don't want to keep on about this report, which hasn't yet been implemented, but I have set out quite a full and reasoned case for extending the Aarhus rules beyond environmental judicial review cases uh, and these recommendations, I think, were supported by the Administrative Law Bar Association and others. I don't think we want to too readily pigeonhole the procedural and cost rules governing judicial review and then just equate it with general civil litigation. Okay, that's, that's a very interesting and, and helpful point. Rupert. I'm grateful to you for that. And then just a couple more um, questions I think that we've got here. One um, uh, is again uh, from uh, the one from James Petz. Um, do the panel agree that the rule of law is dangerously jeopardized by modifying civil procedure, such as to prevent the court from, pro from uh, properly scrutinizing the detail of parties' cases? As without robust scrutiny, uh, the outcome will bear little or no relationship to the parties under the underlying legal rights, uh, where parties exploit a lack of scrutiny. Is that something that... Uh, if you come across every do you yeah, know? I think uh, uh, obviously if you shut people out altogether then there's no scrutiny but I think that you know, it will, that the problem has been that we've tended to go plate the system and whenever there's an attempt to review it and I did have 45 years of the common law bar and I had a, probably a, a, a rather scruffier practice than the two Lords justices who were here I did a lot of knockabout stuff as well as heavy stuff and what, what you see is that there is a, uh, is that it, it's really essential that people can have a crack. And this is Rupert's point, that if you can, certainly in cases up to 100,000, unless there's some very important legal issue which really merits a lot of exploring, um, it is much better that someone can go and do it in one day for predictable costs and get a ruling. And what, what people want is a decision and that they're told this is going to cost them far too much money and they never go to court at all. And what most people want is a fair hearing, which doesn't mean a perfect hearing where every jot and tittle is explored. They want it done by a professional judge and they want access to lawyers to help them through it and do it efficiently. And they'll only get access to lawyers to do it efficiently if they can afford it. And they'll only be able to afford it if it's not too expensive and the costs are predictable. So I think that we, we, we be, uh, as lawyers, and I speak as someone who, as James knows, who we were together on, on the Fees and Legal Aid Committee, and then chair of the bar, who fought the bar's corner on ensuring proper remuneration, but not excessive remuneration. But we have really got to accept that we cannot have gold-plated justice on everything, and it simply cuts people out. I'm not saying that, just to, to reassure your questioner, yeah. I'm not saying that every case where the claim is no more than £100,000 should be subject to the expedited procedure, which I have devised and set out in my report. I provide letouts for those cases which are really not amenable to such um, an expedited <laughs> resolution. Yeah, OK, I think that makes a, a, a fair point there. Can I just come in briefly on this? I mean, we've been debating this issue as lawyers for so long that when I first heard it being debated, oh. it was um, epitomized in the, in the question, should we have a Rolls-Royce system or a mini system, as in the mini? Um, well, the answer is obvious. 
most people, most ordinary people doing ordinary cases want, as Guy has said, a quick, fair answer. Yeah. And um, we spend far too much of our time as lawyers uh, in pursuit of what I call the relentless pursuit of abstract justice yeah. at ruinous cost, which actually is not justice at all. And we all want right. simpler, cheap and cheerful systems which get to the bottom of it because what most people want is an early answer without ruinous cost. And I, I've sat in family cases doing money cases. And I got so angry, I used to give the figures. At the end of the day, um, the matrimonial pie which was being divided up between the parties. Well, the answer was sometimes the lawyers, 60%, um, the wife, 25%, and the husband, 15%. Well, any system which leaves more money in the pockets of the lawyers than those who are litigating is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. And that's why... It's really about proportionality. It's, it's about having proportionate decision-making and, and problem-solving. Yeah. yeah, I entirely agree. And in the family courts, we've been doing this for years. Uh, and I mean, we, I, I imposed a bundle limit. Unless a judge specifically said you could, no trial bundle was to exceed... 350 pages and we've had page limits on expert reports on witness statements there were of course howls of protest at the outset from the usual suspects but i'm not aware of any serious complaint that imposing those manifestly important and useful limits has ever worked injustice quite the contrary right very good point okay and last one i think was really to wrap up could, I was going to paraphrase this one from James, can we ever politically demonstrate to the electorate, can we make it politically popular enough uh, for us to win an election on the basis uh, that uh, long-term adequate financing uh, for legal aid uh, is something that could be sellable in political terms, or is it always going to get pushed down uh, the, um, uh, the pecking order with other priorities? Alex, what do you think on that? Yes, I, I say yes. I'm not defeatist about this. I, because although I sit in a department where the uh, budget is approximately eight, eight billion pounds or so, it depends whether you call it Ardell or Amy, don't, don't worry, but just work on the assumption about eight billion. The, the majority, of course, is prisons, and people like spending money on prisons. They don't necessarily like spending money on legal aid. However, when cases hit the headlines, where there has been a manifest injustice, there is no people quite like the British people to rise up with collective indignation. So for example, when Liam Allen, who you may recall, it turned out had been wrongly accused of a serious sexual offence, and where it turned out that the Crown had uh, failed in its disclosure obligations, the response was appalling. Now, of course, that's a criminal case, and it's one that people can understand perhaps uh, more accessibly than others. But I think it should not be beyond the collective advocacy ability of, of members of parliament and ministers to say, look, if you have these serious injustices, they are offensive to the, to the common good. And I think not just that, I, I, and I, you've got to be careful about alarmist language, but the reality is if people can't get the quick answer, which Sir James referred to, then there is always that risk that there will be a, a rather less attractive form of justice that might be meted out uh, in day-to-day -day life. And I think if one can gently, without being alarmed, convey some of these points, it should not be beyond the realms of possibility uh, and to, to make these points. And last thing I'll say is if you want to put it through a conservative context, I think it's really important to make the point that to be conservative is to be very defensive about that precious balance that exists between the rights of individuals and the powers of a, of a potentially overmighty state. So I think if you're speaking to people about I important long-standing freedoms, I think there's a very powerful argument to make, both in the abstract and in the day-to-day -day practical reality. Those are my submissions. Perfect. Thank you. You, 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 you've wrapped it up very nicely, Mr. Chong. I love that. Very, very great for today. I, I, I think that's been an immensely interesting um, webinar. It's a good point on which to end. I agree with Alex, actually. I've, I'm on record as my, it was more than a month saying that you know, we should regard properly, a properly funded justice system as, as much a part of our social services uh, as education, healthcare, pensions. Yeah, up to yeah. all the politicians to go out and make the case for it. So I think if we, if we pitch it properly and with the sort of information that we've had from our participants tonight, 
uh, then people, I think, will be prepared to, to, to respond. We've got to have the political um, uh, uh, courage to go out uh, and do that. Well, look, we've taken longer than we thought, but I think it's been extremely worthwhile. Thank you all for joining in. If you're not members of the society and, and you support its aims, do please join. We'd be delighted to, to, to have you. Uh, and uh, we've got another webinar uh, coming up, um, which we're doing uh, jointly with the, the Conservative Group for Europe, uh, which is going to be next uh, uh, Thursday, uh, next Thursday, guys. That's right, at um, 18.30, 6.30, for just one hour. Uh, it, it'll be a quick one, but it's a, a very topical. International law, uh, the withdrawal agreement, and the UK. Um, UK's reputation. UK's reputation. Well, oh, that's something which uh, does sound va seem vaguely familiar to me at the moment. Um, but it, it may be by Thursday we have a little bit more light uh, that we can shed on uh, uh, how we might avoid um, uh, anything which damages our reputation, which is something I think is absolutely essential that we do as we go forward. But many thanks to all our participants, James, Rupert, Andra, Alex, Guy. Many thanks to all of you and thanks to all of you for joining in. Ed, thank you very much for doing the technical work as ever. All the rest and good night to you all. Thank you. Good night. 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 Good night.